please join me in welcoming co-founder and CEO of Mist.io, Chris Soltis, to the show. Chris, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for hosting me. All right, Chris, today we're talking about multi-cloud, single cloud, hybrid cloud. I don't know what type of cloud we're talking about just yet. Actually, we're talking multi-cloud, but there's so much that we have to get into. Chris, how about a little bit of backstory on yourself and Mist.io? Yeah, so uh, as you said, I'm the co-founder of Mist.io. Uh, at Mist.io, we're building an open source multi-cloud management platform. And by that, I mean that uh, our end users can come in, uh, connect everything uh, to Mist, and then uh, manage their entire infrastructure from one control panel, the Mist.io panel. So uh, the company uh, was uh, founded in uh, 2013. We started working uh, on the product a little bit earlier, though. Uh, we were uh, trying to scratch our own needs. We were running a consulting agency back in the day. Uh, we were building and maintaining uh, open source based systems for customers around the world. We were a small team and, you know, everybody was somewhere else uh, on cloud, on prem, in colo, you know. Uh, so we started building this tool in order to make our lives easier. And then at some point we said, look, if we need that, maybe there are others uh, out there uh, who need it as well. And that's how it all started. When you created Mist.io or the capabilities doing it and then actually bringing it out as a product, before that, what were you doing? So uh, before that, we uh, were running a consulting agency. We were uh, building uh, and maintaining systems for customers around the world. So they were practically all over the place, uh, public clouds, uh, colo, uh, you name it. So we started building uh, this uh, tool in order to make uh, our lives easier, first of all, you know, uh, make it easier to manage all this heterogeneous infrastructure, wherever it was. Uh, so that's uh, how it started. You know, after a while, we said, look, maybe there are other uh, people out there who uh, need a similar solution. And uh, yeah, that's how the company started. Let's talk about multi-cloud. And I know that's kind of a, I don't know, people don't jump on that word right away. Like it's individual cloud providers are like, no, 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 there's no other cloud that exists, but they are starting to admit that there are multiple cloud providers out there. Now we, most people only talk about the top three, AWS, Azure, GCP. There's others that are available without, you know, within a global reach, but what does multi-cloud mean to you and is it really possible? Yeah, first of all, it is possible. Uh, people do it all the time. It's uh, like the predominant uh, paradigm for uh, running infrastructure these days, even though uh, not everybody is doing it in a conscious and uh, well-planned well way, let's say. So um, what we what we mean by uh, multi-cloud, although you know the term tends to be a little bit uh, overloaded, uh, is a mix of heterogeneous infrastructure, either uh, by like a public cloud vendor uh, or, you know, some sort of uh, private infrastructure uh, that can help uh, users consume uh, infrastructure in, a, in an elastic way. Uh, so uh, that could be, you know, some sort of uh, hypervisor like uh, VMware, or it could be like a private cloud like OpenStack or some sort of a Kubernetes uh, cluster or anything like that. So any mix of all those. So uh, multi-cloud probably can be uh, seen as a, an umbrella term, uh, including you know all sorts of uh, heterogeneous setups, uh, both hybrid, like public, private, but also only uh, public uh, or only private or you know any any other mix like. Uh, private infrastructure, private platforms running on a public cloud, like, you know, uh, a vSphere cluster running on a public cloud or something like that. For multi-cloud, you indicated that companies might not be implemented in the most effective or efficient way. What are some of the things that you're noticing with a multi-cloud environment? You know, in, in most cases, uh, multi-cloud isn't like a strategic decision to begin with it just it just happened and uh, you know by far the number one reason for that are some sort of historical uh, reasons let's say 
uh, you know, we were running uh, applications on VMware, and then we started using AWS, and we created some new applications there. But the old ones never uh, were migrated from our on-prem stack to the public cloud. So, you know, right out of the box, we already have two platforms. And uh, if you count any staging or any dev environments, then these tend to be uh, multiple. Uh, so what we, what we usually see is that overall, you know, applications are very tight to the underlying infrastructure layer. And when a new generation comes out, then the old ones are not dead right away. Uh, migrations are expensive, are complicated, are tricky, and in most cases they never happen. So you know you end up amassing all sorts of different generations and types of infrastructure, uh, matching your application needs, and in a few years, even without taking any mergers or acquisitions into account, uh, your your multi cloud already, right? Um, so. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the predominant uh, case that we we see by far. Uh, obviously, there are also uh, cases where some companies are very conscious about that. So you know, step one, they recognize that they are probably already running in a multi-cloud uh, setup, and they try to do something about it. And um, in uh, in many cases, the correct way is not put everything on AWS wherever it is, like move it there. In many cases, it's about tidying up uh, what you currently do, um, making it uh, more organized and uh, more efficient. So, uh, you know, embracing the complexity, let's say. The example you gave with VMware to AWS or to another cloud provider is that private cloud going to public cloud. So that's multi-cloud or is that hybrid cloud? Yeah, you name it, <laughs> whatever. I, I'm whatever thinking way the terms want, or like, the synonymous, I, the same thing, because uh, those who have a data it, center, right? Yeah. They're like, this is my private cloud environment. No, that's your data center. But however you want to say it, now they have a multi-cloud using private and public. And, you know, you, you didn't take into account ads yet. So it can <laughs> get really, uh, really complicated really quickly. So we tend to prefer the multi-cloud term as like an umbrella term. Okay, obviously like hybrid cloud is more uh, specific, but then, you know, also hybrid cloud, cloud has become a little bit of a, an overloaded term. So, you know, for example, uh, what's Outpost? Is it like a hybrid cloud? Is it a public cloud? Is it an edge cloud? What is it? Like, you know, uh, so there are all sorts of offerings like that, which which blur the boundaries between what we, you would normally call, you know, public cloud versus private cloud versus on-prem or versus whatever. When folks decide to go to the cloud, they have the on-premise, they decide to go to cloud. It's usually done because of the services, but there's another indicator on why they won't, don't want to use one single cloud provider. Do you think there's a fear of vendor lock-in with going with one vendor, with one public cloud? Now for a quick interruption, a huge shout out to our friends at Veeam for sponsoring this episode. Veeam Backup for AWS can easily protect all of your Amazon EC2, RDS, and VPC data. Wait a second, they can protect my VPC data too? Yep, that's right. Simplify AWS backup and recovery while ensuring security and compliance. All right, now back to our episode. Yeah, this is this is a very common, uh, a common uh, issue that uh, we see. I don't know if it's like 100% justified in all cases, to be honest. Uh, you know, in some cases, embracing a single vendor can help you move faster and uh, get to results much in a much better way than doing it like a cross uh, provider. So it kind of depends on the application and the needs of uh, the end user. What are you trying to achieve? What's the business problem? And would multi-cloud make sense in that scenario or not? Because, you know, Spanning one application across multiple clouds, that's usually a very bad idea. Uh, the egress pricing and uh, the, the latency alone can, can kill everything. Uh, so usually it's a really, really bad idea. Uh, but in, in some cases, it would make sense to, you know, spin up applications, different applications solving different problems 
in the infrastructure stack that makes more sense. You know, if it's like a an internal service, why why put it on the cloud? You know, I, I'm betting that you have rack sitting idle in your office as we speak. So you know, why not put it there? Uh, zero latency, zero cost, zero everything. Uh, so it depends a lot. But yeah, obviously vendor lock-in is a big is a big issue. It's a big question. Looking at the exit is always a good idea when you're uh, looking to embrace a new technology. And this goes beyond, you know, the specifics of a public cloud. It, it goes all the way down to your, you know, mobile device or uh, uh, what OS are you choosing? So it's, it's a very similar situation. You have to weigh in uh, the, the you, you have to weigh the benefits and uh, decide what's best for uh, for your case. Many people bring up vendor locking as a reason for doing multi-cloud. But yeah, I don't think this would be a very good idea because this kind of requires to span a single application across multiple clouds. Otherwise, you know, uh, it's there's no real avoidance of the of the vendor locking, right? But I am afraid that in like 99% of the cases, this just adds complexity and uh, overheads and costs that you shouldn't be taking. Uh, so, yeah. I, I think the business reason behind using multiple vendors or multiple clouds is key, but I, there's definitely no cost benefit on splitting your application between multiple clouds. Like you indicated, the egress, the application trying to communicate back and forth, if it's not installed in the right region, it's global, it's banned. But I think the other thing with like a vendor lock is it's an old mentality. They don't want to be locked into a specific, there are so many tools out there. And I want to touch on those in a couple minutes that make it cloud agnostic, that you can go to any cloud provider. But but the reason that you go to a single one is for the cost savings, the benefit and the depth of service as, that are available to you. Now, one cloud provider might provide uh, you know certain tools or certain services that are more beneficial to your business needs than another one. And that's really where you should be gearing towards it. My next question. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. that's best of breed thing is uh, a, a trend that we're seeing and uh, which is very very interesting. I don't know if it will work out in the end because again, it depends on the applications and the type of services that you need to leverage yep. and how these communicate. Uh, but a, a very very common thing, however, that we do notice is um, people people gravity. Uh, we we usually talk about data gravity or something like that. Uh, but there is also a lot of people gravity. Uh, where do people feel more uh, confident? Uh, are they like AWS people? Are they Google people? Are they Azure people? And if they are to deal with this infrastructure the next day, why not let them choose what's best for them? Uh, why why not allow them to to use the the tool that's uh, that's more helpful uh, and uh, they can be more efficient with it. So yeah, people is another big uh, parameter here. Mo mo probably the biggest one, uh, to be honest. It's probably less technology and more about the people. Actually, you touched on my next question, talking about the people. What about the skills required to be multi-cloud? You cannot have one person who is very efficient and a top senior engineer for multiple clouds. It is possible, but it is not efficient because here's what happens. You're designing something for one provider in a specific way. Then you have to switch gears mentally and figure out all the technology, learn everything. You're spending more time learning than actually doing. What about the skills? Isn't that a deciding factor? I, yeah, yeah. I think you said it already. It's about learning, right? Yep. Uh, even in the context of a single provider, things are changing so quickly and so often like, you need to be learning all the time. So uh, I would prioritize softer skills, let's say, like capacity to learn and yep. uh, communication, because this is also really important, especially when you have to deal with uh, multiple people in different roles and, uh, you know, you have to communicate what's going on and uh, make sure that you're making the right choice. So it's uh, these softer skills which are usually the problem in uh, <laughs> in such in such cases learning uh, the capacity to learn and uh, communication 
Who's deciding to actually go multi-cloud? Is it a top-down? Because I don't see many engineers saying, I want to do multiple clouds unless they can really tie in the efficiency of the business application or they want to test something out in a POC. But who's deciding? Uh, it's both top-down and uh, uh, the other way around. Uh, so it depends on the organization to be honest you know with more traditional and more uh, rigid organizations usually it's like a top down approach we we sit on a table we uh, discuss uh, what we what needs to be done we come up with some sort of plan and then uh, it goes uh, to the, the right people to implement it but with more um, agile organizations or smaller organizations we also see a bottom up, bottoms up approach so where you know uh, teams are more free to choose whatever tool they want to work with uh, as long as they can maintain what they're building so uh, we also see this happening a lot uh, usually it's more like in engineering focused uh, organizations uh, who uh, who follow a more loosely uh, coupled approach let's say so both What's your recommendations on actually choosing a cloud agnostic tool or provider? I wish there was a silver bullet. <laughs> yeah. um, in, in like we at Mistio, we're trying uh, to solve part of the problem because solving the entire problem, yeah, I don't, I don't think that it can be done. Uh, it's uh, and you know anyone who says who can that can solve it is probably lying or is he's very very uh, uh, ignorant of what lies ahead. <laughs> so there's no silver bullet, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the, the the problem is so complicated. Uh, the the needs vary a lot between uh, users. So it's practically impossible to find a general solution for everything. Like, you know, Kubernetes uh, rose to, to prominence promising something like an abstraction layer on top of the infrastructure. But, you know, what happens when the next Kubernetes uh, comes up? Uh, yeah, we've, I, I guess you've seen that happening uh, in your career already. If you remember like the OpenStack days, everybody yep. was crazy about OpenStack. And OpenStack will be the future and everything will be running on OpenStack and things like that. And then, you know, containers happened and Kubernetes happened. And I'm guessing that the next thing will happen in the next few years. So uh, what, what are you doing in these situations? Like um, technology in the infrastructure space is moving so fast, meaning you're, you're bound to have this heterogeneity for uh, forever. Uh, even more so now that uh, Edge is coming in the mix. So solving the problem in a general way is practically impossible. What you can do, though, is that you can combine uh, services, tools uh, from here and there, depending on your needs, and try to stitch together a platform that makes sense for, for you. And uh, that's why we've been... Uh, open source since day one. I think like open source solutions are very critical into that. Uh, solutions which you can adopt, modify, edit, make sure that you know what's happening in the background. Everything is transparent, uh, no black boxes. So yeah, these Lego blocks, let's say, that can create a, a platform uh, out of nothing. And uh, I would also advise, like finally, I would also advise against doing it yourself it's specifically because it's such a complicated and uh, big problem engineers tend to you know say why why get something when i can build it from scratch i think like this type of mentality could work in some cases uh, but not in this one and we've seen uh, several large organizations fa failing in the, in such approaches exactly because they thought they can build everything uh, from scratch themselves. Uh, you know, it looks good on paper, but it's a lot of work. It's complicated work. And it's not what drives your uh, business forward. I mean, unless you're an infrastructure company, that is. So I would just suggest integrating different pieces here and there, you know, some sort of cloud management platform, like the one we're building with uh, some sort of 
uh, you know, orchestration tools like Terraform or configuration management, Ansible, or, you know, SaaS uh, like NOPS or whatever, you know, uh, just pull things together and uh, try to build something that's great for uh, your case uh, with us little effort and as little integration and maintenance work uh, as possible. I think building it yourself is a great idea, but in the long run, it's not cost effective. It's difficult to manage and maintain. An example is a lot of the stuff that you build yourself or your company, right? I mean, it, there's nothing wrong with build, using open source to build some things for yourself, but you have to look, take in all the accountability that you have not only tribal knowledge to that application. So now that person, if they leave, it gets a little difficult where if you do get something off the shelf, but tailor it to an open source, uh, the type of integration or plugin, those are some of the benefits of it really kind of going through it. But the cost around it of a multi-cloud environment, we touched on it in the beginning. I mean, how do you manage the cost of two environments and you're not getting the cost savings on it, whether it's public cloud or it's public and private cloud? You tell me. <laughs> I, I'm I'm trying to do it, and it's uh, you know it's it, it's really really hard, and it's much harder than it seems on the surface, um, because it's not just about pricing. You know, pricing is already hard. Try to figure out how you know. <laughs> I don't think any cloud provider anything. makes pricing yeah. as simple <laughs> as it should be because they started out small and it was easy to project and give you some pricing. And now when you have hundreds of services and you have to predict and you've got developers deploying out infrastructure every single where using services at multiple accounts, it just, the pricing gets to be hard. Now try doing that for multiple cloud environments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think like there are three things that you should be uh, very careful uh, about. Like, first of all, Having visibility, you know, this everything starts from there. If you don't know what you're running, where is it, uh, what's uh, its price point, then uh, you cannot do anything. Everything begins from there. Uh, visibility is step one, and then uh, the uh, the second part is proactively controlling cost. Uh, you know, how do I avoid spending too much before I spend it? Uh, and there are many, you know, low hanging fruit that you can. Uh, you can pursue there without like, lots of complexity or uh, uh, many sophisticated like tools or anything like that. You know, for example, the the one example I usually uh, tell people is if you want to reduce your uh, cloud budget, just call your account manager. You know, it's like no a no brainer, uh, zero technical effort, and uh, I'm sure that you will get something in the end of the day. Uh, so, you know, just start from there, like just pick up the yep. phone or send an email or something and that's it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, dumb solution, but it can uh, save you a lot of money really quickly and with zero effort, the most importantly. And then, you know, there are other things that you can do, like, uh, you know, proactively uh, cleaning up your environments uh, when they're no longer uh, needed, which, you know, every week or so, or uh, having some sort of accountability, whose uh, VM is this? Or uh, uh, so, you know, I don't go out to Slack asking, hey, I found this extra large instance. It's called test one, two, three. And, uh, it's, and been it's been running, running for, for 365 years. days. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Whose VM is this? Does it yep. do anything? And things like that. Uh, so I, I avoid situations like that. But you can also constrain uh, who can provision what, you know? Uh, why should everybody be able to provision extra large instances? and not just you know medium ones or small ones or uh, something like that so there are a lot of steps that you can take there in order to proactively control cost and i think this can easily save you like 30 to 40 percent of your uh of your budget at least for dev and qa workloads which are more volatile more dynamic you know production workloads are a little bit different story they're better understood they're well monitored uh, people know what's going on so it's a little bit tricky to save money from that uh, where we see a lot of uh, waste is, you know, these uh, not absolutely required services or dev environments or things like that. And then, you know, 
as long as you have visibility and you have some proactive controls in place, then I would look into the more interesting but more complicated uh, aspect of, you know, how do I optimize? Uh, how do I optimize spending by, let's say, purchasing uh, reserved capacity or by uh, scaling my workloads here and there or moving the VMs from there, from here to there or whatever, you know, there's more, uh, these are really, really important, but, you know, if you don't do the first two, then you're probably uh, won't save a lot of money by optimizing something that you don't know, you know. Uh, if somebody sees his AWS bill increasing 10% month over month, so sounds reasonable. You know, we are increasing our business. The infrastructure cost is increasing. But is is this is this true or not? Or you just have, you know, more and more infrastructure sitting idle. So, you know, it's. Uh, I think you should definitely begin from the visibility part, then go to the proactive step, and then finally begin optimizing something that you already understand really well. Doesn't all three of these things between visibility, control, and then optimizing get really difficult when you have multiple cloud providers? And then how are you doing this in a hybrid type environment if you're using multi-cloud? So, yeah, it's it's certainly more complicated because, uh, you know, if you have one platform, you, uh, you rinse and repeat. You do the same process again and again, even if you have like 100 AWS accounts. You do it again and again and again and again. So it's it's much simpler. Like the the more platforms you have, the more uh, complicated it will uh, it will become. So you know I, that's that's why we think that it's really critical to have like some sort of centralized view of uh, what's your inventory like, uh, and also be able to uh, apply such uh, proactive controls from from one place. Uh, and also, you know, uh, make sure that you can do these optimizations from as fewer places as possible. So, you know, try to, uh, as much as possible, limit the search space, uh, let's say. And, you know, there are, uh, there are tools out there like ours uh, who can help you with that. Well, let's talk about your tool a little bit. I, I know it wasn't one of our topics uh, for the discussion today, but how does your tool help with multi-cloud or these three controls? Yeah, so uh, first of all, in uh, terms of uh, visibility, uh, the only thing you need to do uh, is to connect your cloud account uh, to MIST, uh, like some sort of API credentials. And then in real time, MIST discovers the resources that you have running in your cloud account. So, you know, in a few seconds, you know at least what it is that you're running and where is it and uh, what's uh, the price point for its thing. Uh, so, uh, very, very quick win in just a few seconds. Uh, so that's for uh, visibility. Now for uh, for control, there are obviously, you know, you could uh, perform all common operations that you normally do from your cloud portal, like starting, stopping, resizing VMs. Uh, there are automation uh, workflows that you can apply. You know, for example, if I detect that a VM is idle, uh, stop it. Or there are also additional constraints like, you know, limiting the types of sizes or images that end users can provision, uh, setting expiration dates, everything that gets created over our API uh, gets an ownership tag. So without the user doing anything, without setting labels, without doing anything else, uh, you already know who created this uh, resource and uh, to whom it belongs. And then in the optimization part, uh, we... Uh, we allow you to uh, like quickly detect some uh, some issues uh, which uh, could be problematic. Let's say, for example, you know, uh, detecting that you have uh, provisioned a hundred cores, but you're uh, actually utilizing ten. So, what do you do about that? Or you know, you detect that a VM with uh, uh, with two cores is working at ten percent capacity for the last uh, two months or so. So, you know, scale it down in order to save some money. So things like that. Some of the things that you mentioned in indicated uh, of the three controls that you're doing, is it for all cloud environments? And when I say all, I'm talking like multi, 
a hybrid, uh, maybe Edge, because that's actually an interesting one that we might have to talk about at some point. But does Mist.io handle all those types of capabilities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously there's, there are no price points for uh, private infrastructure. Uh, you know, you can plug in your AWS and it will have the price, prices there, but uh, you can plug in also your vSphere, but it will have uh, no prices there. We do allow you, however, to uh, set custom price catalogs so you can apply uh, price points to your uh, internal infrastructure as well. Uh, but you can also override public infrastructure uh, costs. So, you know, let's say that you have negotiated a discount with AWS. Good luck with that, by the way. So uh, you can apply that uh, to me so you have a better uh, view of uh, what's going on. Uh, we are integrating with more than 20 platforms out there, ranging you know, from bare metals, hypervisors, container hosts, all the way to private clouds and uh, public clouds. Chris, do you think it's gotten a little more difficult now that originally operations used to be the ones that are deploying out infrastructure, whether it was on-premise and now when they're going to the cloud, it started out with operations. But has it become difficult in the new DevOps mentality where developers are deploying out the infrastructure and managing it themselves to handle this in multi-cloud and handle the cost and visibility? Yeah, it's certainly it's certainly a much bigger issue. Uh, it's certainly much bigger than it used to be. Uh, and I would add to that that you know the the footprints have have grown a lot. It's not just one server anymore. It's like 10, 100, 1,000. So uh, it's certainly much harder. And the ops teams, they I don't know how they call them nowadays. It's the, like it was uh, system admins. Yep. They, they were later the DevOps teams. Uh, I think now they're called platform engineers. And I don't know how they will be called. But it's practically like the same people. Uh, so these people, they have a lot of trouble uh, trying to somehow control the situation and why that's why you see this rise of devops tooling um, and it's only going to get worse to be honest that's at least that's what i think so uh yeah there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of pain out there ops teams are even in an even worse position right now than they used to be because they have a lot of pressure to you know keep control uh while not performing the actual provisioning tasks uh, themselves. So they need to be prepared. They need to have everything in place. They need to be testing and maintaining everything. So others can just come in, click a button and get what they need. So yeah, the the, the, the type of the work has changed, and, uh, but it hasn't become easier. It's, it's, it's much harder right now, I think, mostly because of the additional complexity. Chris, before I wrap things up, I got a quick question for you on multi-clouds. That's what we've been really kind of centering focus. I am a customer and I want to go multi-cloud, right? I'm thinking, yeah, this is going to be the best thing. I'm going to use two of those. I'm going to have high availability. My application's going to run. You'll never see it go down. What's the first thing you would recommend to me before going or even thinking about it? I mean, my first uh, recommendation would be don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> it's it's a little bit counterintuitive, like coming from my background. But you know, my my first uh, recommendation would be don't do it. Like, make sure that it's running somewhere. <laughs> Begin like one step at a time. Deploy it. Make sure that it's uh, running somewhere and it's running fine. You understand what what it's required in order to run. Uh, if you're interested in high availability, look look into a multi-region setup before you span the boundaries of a cloud. And uh, you know when you're when you're there, I think I guess that you will understand if you really need a multi-cloud or not. So much the maturity of the application and the maturity of the team deploying, uh, developing, and maintaining the application is really important you shouldn't go like from square zero to like square 100 you should take one step at a time uh, learn along the way and see if it makes sense to go all the way up there so yeah don't do it that's the that's the <laughs> bottom line <laughs> i'm gonna actually tack on to that question who do you think's really driving more of the multi-cloud or should be or even thinking about it startups or enterprises uh it's it's hard to say to be honest um 
I think for some time it was uh, mostly because of startups. Uh, it wasn't that enterprises weren't actually using some sort of multi-cloud setup, but I don't think that they uh, they realized it very early. Uh, now they're realizing it, and I think now the enterprises are the ones who are uh, pushing this forward. So it's a real pr problem that it's really hard to solve. Uh, it's very critical for uh, how well you run your infrastructure and how good business uh, outcomes you deliver. So I, I believe that from at least here and on, enterprises will be the, the main driver and obviously, you know, vendors will follow. And that's why you see, you know, many public cloud vendors lately speaking more about multi-cloud when it used to be uh, a word that was, uh, you know, <laughs> off limits, let's say. You weren't allowed to say it or a minute. So Chris, is there anything you would like to leave the audience before we wrap it up? No, no, I think uh, that was uh, that was really, uh, really great. Like I uh, had a lot of fun uh, doing this and uh, I hope it's going to be helpful for uh, for your audience. Uh, definitely. It's great to hear from thought leadership around multi-cloud. I know it's been a, one of those words that people didn't admit, but now is prominent. And it's helpful to understand what type of cloud environment they want to implement, whether it's an on-premise, hybrid, multi, and upcoming. And I think, Chris, you might want to coin the term edge cloud unless it hasn't been already, because it's very <laughs> interesting. Chris, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, co-founder and CEO of Mist.io, Chris Soltis. I'm your host, John Meyer. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, and notify, because guess what, folks? We're out of here.